it's time to fire this thing up. My sides reading just a shade over 170 degrees. What's the temperature on your I'm motor? I'm a little over 170 also, John. All right. Now, the owner of the boat, back in 2000, when he had it repowered, was telling us at idle, okay, he was running about 165 degrees. Correct. So little by little, the engine temperatures are creeping up. Correct. And that is a real good indication for you at home. If you have inboard engines, gas-powered inboard engines, if you see after about five years, with your exhaust manifolds and risers, temperatures are kind of creeping up. It's time to change those things out. Hey, well, good deal you made it. Hi, I'm John Braviscus. This is Cleet Glasso. How you doing? And Cleet is the owner of Lighthouse Marine Supply. And where we're at is in Riverhead, New York. We're on Long Island. Actually, we're on the eastern side of Long Island. You know, it's about 100 miles long. You've got the fork at the very end. Riverhead is right at the head of the fork. And Cleet's family is very big in the boating industry. And your dad's been in this, and man, it's, it's a whole family enterprise. Cleet owns Lighthouse Marine Supply. His brother actually owns the marina right across the street. That's Lighthouse Marina. And it's this marina where this customer's boat is actually being stored, and that's where he has a service work. Correct. Okay, let me tell everybody what we're on. This is a 1988 34 foot Silverton sedan boat. And Cleet, what's it powered by? Uh, they were repowered 2000 Merc Cruiser 5.7 liter Horizon. All right, now it's been about six years, and we're seeing that the temperature is going up, but just anything over five years, man, it's time to look at exhaust manifolds and risers. And that's what we're going to be covering today here at Ship Shape TV is how to really identify if your risers and exhaust manifolds are going bad. Okay, right. not only with gauges, but with some real gear. We're going to be getting into a teardown, what you have to do to actually prep surfaces and all that. Naturally, we're gonna have to pick some new equipment. We're gonna show you some of the different companies that manufacture risers and manifolds. Now, if you're familiar with that segment in the program that we call in the engine room, oh man, do we have a good one. We're gonna be showing you a tool to where if you ever lose a serpentine belt, if it ever breaks, we're gonna show you how you can actually stitch it back together to where you might be able to limp back in without the aid of Seto. Okay, saving you a bunch of money. But guess what, before we can get into any of this stuff, shoot, you know the drill by now. You see, we need to work out a little trade-off. We've gotta get all of you to spend the next 30 minutes with us as we're working right here along the beautiful water's edge. And then in exchange, with again the help of a few of my very knowledgeable friends in the marine industry, we're all gonna be pooling together in order to do our very best to let you in on a few more ways to make your boat ship shape. Ship shape TV, the world leader in boat improvement, is being brought to you in part by the high-tech, low-maintenance Evinrude E-Tech. Evinrude, spend more time on the water. By Sunbrella Performance Marine Fabrics, shading boats and boaters for over 50 years. We've got you covered, Sunbrella. And by Ray Marine, world leaders in marine electronics. Welcome back. This is a real working 28 acre boat yard slash boat building facility residing in Stewart, Florida. It's Shipshape TV's home base. Ideally located, the complex is situated on the shores of the Okeechobee Waterway, which happens to connect the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. Now once again, here's the founder and host of Shipshape TV, John Graviscus. Well, thanks, Buck. We think we're having a cooling problem on some inboard gasoline powered engines. Welcome back. We again have Cleet Glasso with us. He's the owner of Lighthouse Marine Supply. He sells a lot of these parts. And Cleet, let's begin. Show everybody on inboard gas engines how it cools. Where are the risers? Where are the exhaust manifolds on these engines? John, the exhaust manifold is along the side of the head and the riser is on top of the exhaust manifold. Okay, now we detected on the gauges that were running hot. Normally it was like 165 when these were repowered. 
it's up to over 170 degrees. What tool are we going to verify that we have some problems with these risers, okay, up on top and the exhaust manifolds? This is a pyrometer and it takes the temperature through infrared. Okay, and, and look at, take a look, we're seeing some temperature difference. I'm, I'm actually seeing some hot spots and, and that can detect it. It's up to like 183 degrees in some spots. So that's telling us that these water jackets are closing in, things are starting to season. If they get too hot, you could actually do some catastrophic damage. Yeah, then you can damage. do. Then you can overheat your engine, and, and you don't want that. Okay, well, let's do this. We don't want to break the bolts just yet. I'm using some PB blaster. This is a good lubricating type of penetrating oil, and I'm just going to spray all the heads for the bolts so that we can take these things apart, and then overnight, we'll come back in the morning, and we'll do the teardown. John, where we begin with the teardown is that we want to drain all the water from the riser and exhaust manifold. So typically we remove the hose clamp and take the hose off the bottom of the manifold. This is Steve Lillenpakis and he's the head mechanic out here at Lighthouse Marina. Now we got the water away. How do we get the riser or the elbow off of the exhaust manifold? What tools do we use? Well, what we use is we use a 3 8 ratchet with a 916 socket, and we loosen the four bolts on the top of the riser. Okay, so we got those four bolts out, all right? Now, sometimes that gasket and, and, and those two pieces will actually kind of really be still together. Fuse itself together. All right. How, they're heavy, they're cast iron. How can we separate this? How can we get the riser off and get it out of the boat uh, to really lighten the load? What we like to do is we use usually a rubber mallet to shock the riser and it separates the two from each other. So okay. it's a lot easier to carry it. How many bolts are holding on the exhaust manifold? And, and, and remember, every, every engine out there that is an inboard or a stern drive gasoline powered motor is a Chevy block. Yes. Okay. How many bolts hold on the exhaust manifold? They use four bolts. Okay. And it, we still use the same tools that we use to remove the riser to uh, take the exhaust manifold. Okay, off. now here's where you might get into trouble, okay? If you get any pieces of the gasket down into the engine, if you get any chunks of that uh, uh, metal, okay, the actual cast iron uh, from the corrosion down into that engine, you can really screw it up. What do we do to avoid that? Typically we like to use some shop rags or even paper towel to install into the port so no you know, foreign debris gets in there. Okay, now again, this guy waited six years to change these things out. He went a little bit too a little long. too far. All right, how do we get the gasket? Because it might really be fused onto the that head. actual head. Okay. Yes. What we use is um, just a straight edge gasket scraper to remove the large pieces of the gasket that may be left behind. Um, after we do that, we usually go ahead and use a right angle die grinder with a light abrasive wheel to remove all the you know, remnants that are left behind to have a clean surface. It's very important to have a clean surface. When you're scraping the gasket, don't gouge that metal, guys. Okay, get all the debris off. But let's talk about the new gasket going for the new exhaust manifold. Do we want to use any type of silicone adhesive? and then put the gasket on, or do these go on dry? These gaskets get installed dry. We don't use any type of sealers on there. The heat of the motor will eventually get it to work to seat, to seal. To seal, yeah. Okay, but there's a real trick, okay, because sometimes the next gasket that goes on top of the exhaust manifold to the riser, that thing can cock like on you and turn. What, 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 do, what, do the, what do the pros use? Usually we use the the Permatex high tack sealer. We like to spray the exhaust manifold and the riser and both sides of the gasket. It works like a contact cement, so we usually let it sit and dry, and then we install it in place, and then you could start the assembly. And, and that keeps them from cocking or twisting? Yes, it or... helps it from falling out of place and having any type of misalignment. Steve, man, you are such a wealth of knowledge. Thank no you problem. so much for your expertise. Right now, we need to take a short break, okay? We need to hear from our sponsors, but keep it right here because when we come back, we're going to learn what boaters have in the way of options of new exhaust manifolds and risers, and we'll cover it right after this important timeout. The tool shed's still open, so stick around. Shipshape TV will be back in a flash. Welcome back. The light's still on in the tool shed, which means there's still work to do. What do we have, John? Welcome back. We are in Riverhead, New York, and our topic today is we're changing out some exhaust manifolds and risers on a pair of engines in a Silverton 34-foot sedan. Hey, we again have an expert in marine parts 
with us. This is Cleet Glasso, the owner of Lighthouse Marine Supply. And Cleet, I know that customers have a choice with exhaust manifolds and risers on, on what brand that they can put onto an engine. But before we get into what's available, let's talk a little bit about Lighthouse Marine Supply because I've been doing business with you for years and, and I'm down in Florida and you're up here in New York and you have this really cool ad campaign where we, you know, mild manner, Cleet Glasso, all right? And you transform into the superhero part man and you fly around and you're delivering marine parts to boaters kind of saving their weekends and it's a very clever advertising campaign that's really caught on but and I wanted the audience to really kind of come into your world and how Lighthouse Marine Supply is so different. What kind of sets you apart from the big box marine stores? Well John if you're looking to buy a pair of shorts or a boat shoes then you go to a store like West Marine but if you want engine parts, manifolds, starters, alternators, you come to us. Put the gloves away, dude. <laughs> that was pretty tough. That, they're, no, they're, they're great stores too, but, but you're really the part specialist. That's what we okay, do. Okay, that's where you put your money into. Right. All right. Now, you have a big operation out here on the east end of Long Island. Customers come in and literally it's shelf after shelf after shelf of rope and anchors and anti and paint and oils and lubricants and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But back behind the doors in the retail center, Man, you have a warehouse. And I've never seen so many doggone parts in my life. What's back in the warehouse? Well, John, we have belts, we have hoses, form-fitted hoses for fuel lines, for cool, uh, cooling systems. Um, we have starters, we have alternators, we have uh, tune-up parts, and uh, we have exhaust manifolds, of course. Let's get into what is the customer's choice with this particular job? Okay, in the way of manifolds and risers. Well, Johnny, he, he could choose original equipment Mercruiser manifold. He could choose a bar aftermarket manifold or an Osco aftermarket manifold. Okay, let, let's get into warranty on original equipment it, so versus aftermarket. Is there a difference? Yeah, these original equipment have a one-year warranty. The aftermarkets both have a three-year warranty. Okay, now what about price between the two? You will pay about 30% more for the original equipment. All right. Now, is there a difference with where these things are made? Because let's face it, uh, you know, if a part's being made in China, they don't really have the quality control. Uh, steel, cast iron, and these parts are cast iron, uh, are very well known in the United States. Where are all these parts made? All these are made in the United States. Okay. And, and is there a weight difference? Are the aftermarket, are they using less cast iron? Than original equipment or what? Now actually John if you lift up this bar aftermarket and feel that. Okay and this cast iron is quite heavy and, and take a look at how much material is between the water jackets and that exhaust. Okay there's quite a bit of material. All right. And then you, if you lift up the original equipment it's actually a little lighter. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about this display that we have here and the importance of changing these things out if you bone in salt water every five years, okay? And this customer went six years, okay? He's pushing the envelope. But where do these things fail? Well, John, as you can see, this is the blue area it represents the salt water running through the manifold to cool the hot exhaust gases, the red. Okay. Okay? And what happens is this, after time, this wall thins out, and then the water will seep into the red section, into the exhaust side, and the engine will actually pull that water into it. It'll hydrolock, and you'll get catastrophic engine failure. Instantaneously, okay, and you're talking about thousands of dollars for a motor versus hundreds for these parts. That's why the maintenance is so important. That's right. All right. Yes. Now, you also deliver parts, Cleet, to different marinas. You, you have route sales, and whether it's a marina or it's a guy working out of his van, you know, servicing the boat or something like that, you actually deliver it to New York. But I found you through mail order. And I know that you're shipping these parts out all over the world. Talk, talk to us about that. Well, John, we do ship worldwide. Our website is www.partman.com. All right. And we have an extensive inventory. So after your order gets logged in, your order will ship within hours. Fantastic. Well, you definitely are a superhero Thank you. in the marine part world. Thank you so much. Hey, right now we need to take a very short time out. But keep it right here because when we come back, we're going to be back in Florida. And we're going to show you how to save a belt that is broken out in the water. We'll get into it right after this.
Shoots Hit TV will be back in a flash. Oh, hey, we are thrilled that you're still with us. Let me real quick turn on the autopilot in order to head down below. I want to show you a couple of key things that you need to know about in the engine room. This week's In the Engine Room segment is being brought to you in part by Kohler Power Systems. We definitely have a problem right here. The serpentine belt has actually snapped or, or it's come apart right at the seam where they first manufactured the belt. Hey, welcome back. We're kind of stranded out here on the side of the channel in my neighbor's boat. And this is Bruce Blakesley. Bruce and I have been neighbors for about 11 years. And this is his 25 foot 1998 Steiger. Right, built up on Bellport, Long Island. Built in Long Island and is powered by a Volvo Penta 5.7 liter GI engine. And we've got a couple of choices here, Bruce. We could either call a tow and service, which is gonna be big money, or we could fix the belt. And that leads us to our next expert guest. Okay, she's been on the program before. This is Sonora Early. Sonora, how are you? Hi, John, I'm good. Great to have you back on the program. So we've got, we've got a broken belt. We've got two sides to this belt, all right? Now, on your boat, you might have a nail. I've got a little finish nail right here or you might have a fish hook, all right? And what we've got to do with this fish hook or the nail is we actually, see where the break is, we actually have to come back about, what, three-eighths of an inch, Sonora? Is that yep, what you're talking right. about? Three-eighths yep. of an inch, and we want to come about maybe a quarter inch, three-eighths of an inch in, and we want to sit there and we want to poke a hole all the way through the belt. Okay, Bruce? And got we it. want to do the same thing on the other side. We want to put two holes on one side of the belt, okay? Now on the other side of the belt, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna put in two holes. So we've got four total holes, two on each side of the belt. Now, Sonora, could you show everybody the clamp tight tool? Yeah, they, there it is. All right, check this out. Simple enough. This is the handiest thing that you're ever gonna make for clamping, okay? Mm -hmm. in, in our case, we're gonna be stitching a belt to, together, back together. But show everybody the wire too, Sonora. All right. What, what, this is stainless steel, right? Right, it's 316L, All and right. the size is a 41 thousandths. It's a real good uh, general purpose, always to have it on the boat. Okay, now, Sonora sells the wire, she sells the tools, so we're, we're gonna show you how to fix this. Okay, now, we're going to cut, you told me, Sonora, a first piece of wire is gonna be about two feet long. Right. All right, and we've got to fold it in half, and we have to somehow manage to get both of those pieces of wire through this hole. So your hole has, you know, you don't want it too large, but you don't want it too small. You gotta get both pieces of wire down through one hole. We're going to kind of bring it over to the other side and come up through the belt with that wire. And you're gonna have two ends on one end and you're gonna have the loop on the other end. All right, now, now Sonora said you stick both of those ends through the loop, all right? And that's when you bring in the clamp tight tool, right? That's right. Okay, now, now check this out. Here, let me see this one. Do you guys see the end right there? See that little notch? See that, Bruce? Oh, yeah. See that notch right there? Okay, well, that actually goes on the loop side of the wire, mm -hmm. okay? And, and it kind of pushes there. Come over this peg, we come over the second peg, we come underneath on both sides, and then we twist. There you go. All right, now, this is so cool because as you twist this knob, okay, it, it, it works in two directions. It, it pushes the one end of the wire and it pulls the other end of the wire. Now, Sonora, what happens if I make this clamp too tight on the belt? You can actually rip through it, and so you don't want to over-tighten it. Okay, okay. We're just trying to get these two pieces together so that it's going to hold and run through the pulleys on the, on the engine, Bruce. Okay, so once we get that in place, we're going to have a couple of... Uh, of ends that we've got to cut from the tool. And just with a pair of wire snips, we can sit there and we can, you know, wire cutters, we can cut that wire off. And you want to cut it maybe about a quarter inch long and then take your, take that blunt end of your pliers and just kind of press that in. And so that way you're not going to have any rough seams or anything exactly. like that. Mm -hmm. Now, Bruce, we'll, we'll kind of restraddle everything around all the pulleys okay. once our belt is seamed together using that clamp tight tool then we can go ahead and we can actually uh, work on that tension bar on that one pulley. We can get our belt tight, fire up the engine, we're gonna be able to build them home. 
Bruce, man, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, Sonora, thank so you, much. Hey, right now we need to take a very short time out, but keep it right here because when we come back, we'll get back into it. That's right. Our project today is pretty much complete, which means we're now back on the water with John. What you're looking at is Peconic Bay here in Riverhead, New York. Hey, welcome back. I don't know if you're into sweet scallops, man, but these guys have some world famous ones here in Peconic Bay. And we have been changing out the exhaust manifolds and risers on this 34 foot Silverton today. I want to give you a couple more tips when you're changing out your exhaust manifolds on the boat. Before you unbolt anything, remove your spark plug wires. These are very heavy cast iron items and they have a tendency to surprise you in weight and they're going to fall. If you bend those wires, they're messed up. Okay, get them out of the way. Also, inevitably, you might hit a spark plug or two with the weight of that cast iron item. So this is a good planning time. Plan to change out your spark plugs. When you get your new gear, no matter whose product it is, they're inevitably going to paint the critical surfaces. And what I'm talking about here is this is the water passage in between the riser and the manifold. You want to remove that paint. You want to get it down to bare metal. Also, when you're torquing on the exhaust manifold onto the head, you want to do this in a series of steps. You want to torque it slowly down to the manufacturer's specification. You might want to go through about a three-step process. What I like to do is get out in the boat, run it, get the engines hot, let it cool down and give it its final torque to that end or to the manufacturer's specifications. Hey, we've got a couple of people that we need to thank who helped make today's show possible. First off, Cleek Glasso over at Lighthouse Marine Supply. Greg Scholand was on the program. Also, Cleek's brother, Alex Glasso, the owner of Lighthouse Marina. We also had the head mechanic, Steve Lillampakis. All right, great technician. This dude really knows his stuff. Sonora Early with the clamp tight tool really helped us out. My neighbor Bruce, man, we had so many people. My guys, like always, work so hard. Thank you guys. But most importantly, the one that we need to thank here today, that's you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us right here on the beautiful water's edge for the last half hour. But we've got to go, but how about this? How about until we see each other again? Can you do yourself a favor? Can you get out there and make your boat ship shape? Of course you can. I'm John Graviscus. We'll see you next time.